those of you that were in the meeting, you'll have heard me say this already, but uh, we'll, what we are hoping to accomplish these next couple months is a series to finish up the year of mercy, uh, going through the corporal works of mercy. So Father was nice enough to volunteer his time to be here with us to get us kicked off with just an overview of the corporal works of mercy, and then the next coming months we'll have speakers lined up to give individual talks on, the, on some individual corporal works of mercy. So, without further ado, round of applause for Father. Of course, the first corporal work of mercy is to feed the hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we look forward to, to Paul coming with the pizza. <laughs> but uh, should we start with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving, gracious Father, we thank you for this beautiful gift of a jubilee year of mercy. Open our minds and hearts to your Holy Spirit, that we might receive all of the graces you so abundantly pour forth to us in this year, that we might rejoice knowing the risen Lord Jesus is with us. He guides us, he supports us, he nurtures us, he consoles us, he blesses us. And help us to be his hands, his feet in the world, to bring his merciful love to all those whom you place in our path each day, especially beginning in our homes. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So there's just a couple of things I'd like to do regarding the Jubilee Year of Mercy uh, and speaking about the corporal spiritual works of mercy. First, a, a word of history. Ah, uh, yes, you're stuck with a historian, this pastor. <laughs> the Knights of Columbus were founded as a work of mercy. You know that there were the working conditions of the 19th century, uh, there were very often uh, on-the-job fatalities. Father McGivney founded the Knights of Columbus to take care of the widows and children of those who died. And that's how this became an insurance company. But you think of the Knights of Columbus today as an insurance company. You don't necessarily think of a work of mercy. Insurance is just the modern way of trying to fill the need of the work of mercy that Father McGivney began with. To care for the widows and orphans. So, I want you to see that at the heart of the Knights of Columbus, its very birth, comes from one of the works of mercy. But we can go back a little bit further in history. We can go all the way back to Jesus and to find what role do the works of mercy play in the life of a Christian. And what you find is that throughout all of the history of the church, the works of mercy, spiritual and corporal works of mercy, have never been understood to be optional. Never. We live late 20th, early 21st century in a, in a time when all of a sudden the work of mercy can simply be, I write a check. The difficulty is that somehow, somehow we absolve ourselves of the responsibility of works of mercy with the thought, yeah, I'll just make a donation. And we, we engage our pocketbook, but not our heart. But not our heart. And so it, it, it is worthwhile, I believe, to go back and see where the works of mercy fall in. Of course, this year, uh, Pope Francis is going to canonize uh, the woman who single-handedly represents the works of mercy uh, over the last uh, close to 100 years, and that is Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Her, her very name is synonymous with works of mercy. And she's going to be canonized at the end of this uh, jubilee, towards the end, in early September. 
Mother Teresa, in that simple way that saints do, said you could sum up the entire gospel on five fingers. You did it to me. You did it to me. See, that's the whole gospel summarized. So then, what she's referring to, of course, is Matthew chapter 25, where we have a parable. The parable is of the last judgment. So not just, okay, here's a nice parable, there's a nice, no, 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 here's, the, here's a biggie. <laughs> this is talking about salvation. This is talking about what it's going to be like when at the end of our lives we stand before our God for judgment. And basically Jesus said there are going to be a bunch of surprises. There are going to be people that are going to be going to heaven. And say, well, well, why am I doing this? Well, because I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. Well, Lord... I mean, I don't want to object to going to heaven. However, when did I see you hungry and give you anything to eat? Whatsoever you did to the least of these, you did it to me. And the others that Jesus condemns, you did not give me food when I was hungry. You did not give me drink when I was thirsty. And, well, no, no, no. We would have done that if we'd seen you. No. Whatever you didn't do to the least of these, you didn't do for me. And they depart to eternal unhappiness. So, Jesus is giving us a pretty straightforward criterion for what does it mean to live the great commandment. The great commandment, right? Because he said you would summarize all the commandments as love of God with your all, your mind, your heart, your soul, your strength, your all. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then we see throughout the scriptures this unfolding that the love of God and the love of neighbor are intertwined. That in fact, the scripture tells us, don't even say that you love the God you can't see if you don't love your brother whom you can see. Right? Love is an abstract concept and nothing real unless you put it into practice. And the, and the divinely inspired word of God tells us tells us that to put it into practice with respect to loving God means you better be loving the people made in the image and likeness of God, the people that God himself has placed in your path. So that's where we, we get our theological framework for the works of mercy. So then let's speak about a little bit in the scriptures how we see this lived out in the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts gives us, of course, the life of the early church. We read the Acts of the Apostles as the first reading throughout the Easter season, talking about how did those first disciples live right after the resurrection. And there are any number of things that we can, can reference here. I just want to pick out a couple of them. When uh, the Christians in Antioch, which is where the first time they were called Christians, uh, when they, they gathered together and said, there was a great famine over all the world and this took place in the days of the Emperor Claudius. And the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brethren who lived in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Right? And we have other places where uh, we have Paul writing to the churches and saying, I'm coming your way, and I'm giving you a forewarning so you can get the collection ready, so that I can take it to those in need. There's this constant care for the material needs as well as the spiritual needs. And that's why we have seven spiritual works of mercy and seven corporal works of mercy. Corporal, of course, corpus meaning body. So the material needs, the needs of body and soul. The human person is a composite of body and soul. 
And Christ wants to care for us, body and soul. The other passage in the Acts of the Apostles that I want to make reference to is one that is stronger than unique. Uh, let's just call it bizarre. All right? Uh, I don't want to critique the Word of God, but, but this <laughs> little story is just a little bit bizarre. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Okay? So the end of chapter 4, we have several verses talking about now the company of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had everything in common. Okay? They had everything in common. And so we're talking about them caring for one another by pooling their resources. There was not any one needy among them, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, laid it at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made to each as any had need. So, this sounds remarkably uh, like a fellow named Karl Marx. No, it doesn't. Uh, uh, this is not communism, which is a forcible appropriation and redistribution. This is a free act of love. Right? Radically different. It's the opposite of communism. They say, comrade, we come to you and we take from you. Right? This is, this is not, or actually, I, I use a Russian accent, but perhaps uh, Uncle Sam does a bit of this himself. Uh, but uh, closer to home, we, we have these issues. But it's important for us to see we can, we can grouse about tax rates and this and that and the other and, and uh, the, the, the erosion of the dignity of the human person that comes from the welfare state and all of this. But we can't get away from the hard truth that the early Christians took very seriously this sharing of resources. Right? They didn't see it as mine. The danger for us we live in the most affluent society that has ever been in existence. Is that even Christians can get a little bit of the my mentality. You know? when, when people say to me, oh, Father, we, we wish we didn't have to drive so far to church, but, you know, the, the church, the, the houses in the neighborhood around church, they're just too small for our family. Really? I bet if we looked back at the census 60 years ago, we'll find that these little houses around here that we say are too small actually had just as many or more children in them. But somehow our mentality, we're shifting, we're going soft, we're getting comfortable here, which necessarily means our eagerness for the kingdom wanes. The more comfortable I am here, the less oomph I put into that prayer, thy kingdom come. So here's this bizarre story I want to share with you. We've just been talking about sharing everything in common. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. 
But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of those that have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Well, the gospel of the Lord. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bizarre story, isn't it? I'll tell you how bizarre is it that we have this continuous reading through the Acts of the Apostles. It ends with the last verse of chapter 4. And it begins with the verse, that's the first verse that I haven't read to you. It skips the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Totally skipped in the liturgical cycle of readings. Hmm. Interesting. But the Word of God has a message for us. If you say you're going to share, if you say you're going to enter into a community where we care for one another, don't do it part way. Because that's not what living discipleship looks like. So now, I'm not going to pass up envelopes for a capital campaign. All right? I promise. The way that this early Christian community has lived out today uh, is in religious life. You know, the, the monks, uh, the, the nuns that take a vow of poverty have nothing. Everything is in common. That, that is the modern inheritor of this community that we speak of. So you don't have to all go and, and sell everything you have and come and, and bring it here. I don't have room in the rectory for all of you, okay? <laughs> And, and unless you like mac and cheese and Pop-Tarts, I don't know what I'd feed you. <laughs> but we need to take seriously this concern for one another, this overcoming of the me and that insidious desire to hold stuff back. And, and this trust in God that frees us <coughs> from that slavery to material possessions. But the, the spirit of, I give everything because I realize it all came from God to begin with. Oh, well, wait a minute. No, Father, I worked for that. Oh, yes, you did. But who gave you the talents that enabled you to work? Who gave you the opportunities in able to put your talents to work? You didn't do it on your own. None of us do. We forget that. My money, I work for it. No. But it's not about money, it's about the care and the concern for what we call the common good. But as soon as you use a phrase like common good, it becomes impersonal and abstract. And that's why reading these stories from the Acts of the Apostles, we see this immediacy. The need of this person here is real to me. And not something that I can simply wash my hands and say, well, I hope there's a government program that can take care of that. You know, I paid my taxes, so go, go stand in line at the county. So the corporal works of mercy from the beginning were this aspect of the Christian community expressing its love. And that money doesn't divide us. Money actually is used to create bonds between us. You have needs, I have surplus, I give. You have needs, I don't have surplus, I sacrifice. This is the Christian way. Let me explain to you an important thing from one of our enemies who understood this message. Have you ever heard of Julian the Apostate? Julian the Apostate was an emperor in the 4th century. The word apostate, not to be confused with apostle, uh, it means the opposite. An apostate is a Christian who then renounces Christ. Julian was the nephew of the emperor Constantine. We remember Constantine? Right around the year 313, 314, somewhere in there, after winning a great battle, after a vision, uh, he legalizes Christianity. 
and begins building the first churches. Christianity takes off. It had already been strong, actually, despite the persecutions. The persecutions couldn't wipe it out. That was, in fact, the reading from today. Uh, the first reading in the Acts was about Gamaliel saying, you know, if this is from men, it's going to die out, but if it's from God, and you're opposing it, <coughs> you're not going to win, and you're fighting God himself. Well, that is, of course, what happened. The, the, the persecution of Christians did not wipe out Christianity, but in fact, the Holy Spirit made Christians stronger and more numerous, despite the persecution. Well, Julian the Apostate becomes emperor because there were problems in Constantine's family. And so the throne passes to his nephew. His nephew, uh, who had been a Christian and actually had been uh, a lector, renounces Christianity and goes back to the old pagan ways. Because you see, Constantine didn't force everyone to become Christian. Constantine didn't make Christianity the official religion. He just legalized it, and then later on he himself became Christian. But the people around were still largely pagan, especially the, the educated, respectable classes, the leadership classes of the empire. But they were coming around and, and hearing the gospel. They were becoming Christian. Julian said, I don't like this. We're going to turn back the clock and have the good old days of the Roman Empire with good old pagan ways. We're going to pray to Zeus and all of the rest of this. So, Julian launched a massive persecution of the church. Uh, no, actually he didn't. No, no. Julian learned from the lessons of history. Julian saw none of those persecutions had worked. You know, what's the definition of insanity? Keep doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different result. Uh, okay, let's see. We, we had the, the, uh, the persecution of Nero, we had the persecution of Claudius, we had Decius, uh, we had Valerian, and then of course the last one, right before Constantine, the biggie, Diocletian. None of them worked. So we're going to change strategy. What attracts people to Christianity? Well, you know, all these people that, that worship Zeus, well, they don't really do much for each other, do they? But these Christians, wow, they care for one another. They, they take care of the poor. They, they have hospitals for the sick. They, they do all these amazing things. And people go, oh, isn't that beautiful? Oh, I think I want to know more about that. That, that looks like a really nice way to live. Those look like people that I'd like to have as my neighbors. So Julian, instead of persecuting the Christians, tried to one-up them. He went on a spending spree. St. Zeus Hospital. You know, he, in the name of paganism, started doing all of these philanthropic things. But you can't force it. And, and the state can't buy it. <coughs> and, and Julian uh, died, and, and all of the paganism <coughs> faded away. It was, it was a brilliant strategic move on his part. But you can't do it by edict. This, these works of mercy are only successful when they're authentic, and they're only authentic when they're the fruit of love. The fruit of love. Not a political campaign by the emperor. But that's how Julian understood that the dynamism of Christianity was linked to the way that it lived out the corporal works of mercy in the world. The way that Christians said, I follow the Lord of love by loving. That's what
what I do. That's what Jesus told me to do. And so that's where we come then to these works of mercy. Now, in the church, we, we obviously associate with the spiritual works of mercy. You know, um, you know, but what about the corporal works of mercy? Those are the ones that we want to think about in a, in a particular way uh, tonight. We want to think about feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, sheltering the homeless, ransoming the captive, or, or visiting the prison, visiting the sick, and burying the dead. These are the corporal works of mercy, the seven corporal works of mercy. And when we look to the saints, we always find their lives characterized by the works of mercy. You can't read, I have 13 volumes of Butler's Lives of the Saints. You can't read a single life of a single saint that's not characterized by works of mercy. So for us, as Christians, we're all called to holiness by our baptism. We're all called to become saints. It means we're called to live out the works of mercy. In a particular way also, just as uh, Julian the Apostate recognized, so blessed Paul VI in the 1970s, looking at the modern world, looking at the rise of secularism, uh, looking at uh, the decline of faith, looking at the need for evangelization, he said this, the modern world listens not so much to teachers anymore, but it pays attention to witnesses. To witnesses. Right? Teaching. Church documents. Beautiful documents. Beautiful theological studies from 2,000 years of, of, a, of an intellectual tradition that gave rise to the university system. There's lots of good stuff out there. But people don't read it. How do you, how do you, if you go onto the internet, how do you figure out the difference between Thomas Aquinas uh, and the, the weatherman who said it was going to be sunny today, right? You know, how do you, how do you account for what is, is worth more and, and all the rest? It's just, we're inundated by waves of information. But witnesses, wow, they grab our attention. And that's why the works of mercy are important. Not just because it's part of living out our, our, our Christian faith, so it's fundamental that way, but it's also fundamental to what we call the new evangelization. That is, that effort to proclaim Christ anew in the world of today. It's not going to happen by waving theology textbooks. We have to attract the world's attention and get them to want to learn about Christ. And the way you do that by being a witness. And that's what Mother Teresa did so beautifully. That's what all the saints do. St. Peter Claver, a great, great Spanish missionary, uh, he's called the apostle to the slaves, or, or he would call himself the slave of the slaves. Uh, so many waves of slave ships came uh, from Africa and would land at uh, Cartagena, in Colombia, and he worked the docks of Cartagena. And what he did is, uh, these, these people, he cared for their bodily needs first. And only afterwards did he speak to them about God and Jesus and faith and the gospel and the commandments and, and all of the rest. But first, he wiped away their, their blood, their sweat, their tears. He, he gave them uh, blankets to warm them up. He fed them. He cared for their body so that they would know that he cared for their soul. And that's what we've got to, to, to realize. We could, we could have a digression about how the modern welfare state, starting uh, with actually going all the way back to the dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII, but that would be another 45 minutes. I'll, I'll skip that for you to see. I'll have mercy on you. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
But over the last 500 years, the state has imposed programs uh, by enforced taxes to replace what used to be done freely by Christians. And the state does a pretty lousy job of it in comparison. You know, but when you read about Charles Dickens and, and the, the terrible plight of Oliver Twist in the workhouses, it's because the monasteries of England were destroyed. Those were the places where the poor could go and be cared for. Right? So just to know that in the distant background, that, that, that throughout history there's been this shift of the last 500 years. And, and so Christians... We've got to, to take responsibility, not just say, well, I pay my taxes, so the government's going to take care of the poor. No, that, that, that doesn't do it that way. But we have to realize that there's this jockeying and this, this shift that's going on. You know, uh, next week, Mary Jo Copeland is, is receiving an, an award. If you know who she is, uh, she founded a thing called Sharing and Caring Hands uh, downtown. And she did it because she herself had suffered enormously. And through her own suffering, she developed compassion for the sufferings of others. We've got to, to look into our own hearts and see, because the victim mentality these days, when I suffer, I demand more, give me more, I deserve something because I suffered. You know? She did the opposite. I suffered. And so I want to help others in their suffering. And so today she feeds a thousand people every day. And she does it all depending on God's providence. Not a single stinking penny from the government. Whether the city, the county, the state, or the vets. No money from the United Way. Because she has on every wall a crucifix. She gives every person she meets a rosary. And right now, some of the, the poorest people, the most in need in, in our community are, are some of these recently arrived Somalis. And, and she's caring for them. And sometimes people criticize her. And, and she says, she says, I am just called to love. And I don't have to teach these people the catechism. They simply see what a Christian looks like. That's evangelization. That's living the great commandment. That's the works of mercy in action. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So I just want to give you this overview so that as these lectures go on throughout the months, you speak about particular works of mercy, particular saints that embody those works of mercy, particular ways that, that we ourselves uh, can get back to the basics of living the works of mercy, that you just have this big picture framework to, to kind of understand where it all comes from, what it's about, why it's important for me and for the task of, of, of announcing Christ to the world. And to, to not fall into the trap of holding something back from the Lord, uh, but to give of ourselves to His service, whatever that looks like, to do with a generous and joyful heart uh, the work of Christ to bring His love to those around us, body and soul. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.